Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to what is our now our final session of our 10th SBAS conference with its well-chosen title of Geopolitics is Back. It seems an age ago since we organized the first SBAS conference, we can, I think, all be immensely proud within SBAS of what's been achieved in the past decade, not least providing the capacity for foresight in every EU institution. In the past couple of days, we've had a more seamless way of organizing the 14 sessions than in the past, with more than 50 speakers, uh, many from outside the EU. My personal thanks go to the speakers for their excellent contributions and the moderators for their effective management of their sessions, allowing a broad range of views to be expressed. I think it's a terrific tribute to the cooperative nature within SBAS, the team spirit, and not least, I do have to say, the profound dedication of Graham Carter to ensure that all the sessions actually occurred as planned. Yes, please give him a round of applause. Uh, the remit of the conference was, at the outset, was to seek to provide a strong forward-looking perspective on key global challenges and how we can build a robust, sustainable future for the European Union. From the stimulating and imaginative exchanges in the last couple of days, we have, I believe, successfully fulfilled this remit. They'll provide substantial new thinking and ideas into the 2024 ESPAS Global Trends Report and facilitate the development of an international dimension for ESPAS, the ESPAS Dialogue. So the purpose of this final session, entitled The Future of the EU, Strategic Foresight and the Role of ESPAS, is to give the leaders of ESPAS the opportunity to contribute their views about priorities in the months ahead. We're very fortunate to have with us today uh, four, well, we will hopefully have four, but currently we're three. So firstly, we have Klaus Weller, Secretary General of the European Parliament, Stephen Quest, Chair of ESPAS and Director General of the Joint Research Centre at the European Commission, Didier Suisse, so Director General, General and Institutional Policy, General Secretariat, Council of the European Union. And we are waiting for Hervé Delfin, Acting Director, Strategic Communication and Foresight, European External Action Service. We have 40 minutes now for our last session. So to start the debate, I'll ask each panelist to give their thoughts, maybe three key priorities of the conference that has taken place, looking for the months ahead where as we should be going with our foresight work. And then, of course, I'll come back to each panelist once we've had the debate involving people online and in the audience. So, Klaus, over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, James. Um, I had the debate with uh, Fiona Hill, and I have to say I enjoyed it very much. She was also very generous with her time with us. And our debate was about, is there a paradigm shift linked to the Russian aggression on Ukraine? And uh, I believe we, con we could confirm that, in fact, there is. Uh, there is the attempt by Russia to get us back to the principles of the 19th century, where smaller neighbors could be incorporated by force by bigger and violent countries. There is the attempt to create a bipolar world, which is not innocent, but simply means that uh, the individual is not necessarily protected, but can be sacrificed uh, for some higher good. Um, but there is also a new European map, which is bringing the European Union as the union of citizens and states together in the center and in the west. And on the other hand, empire for Russia in the east and the, the space in between is becoming the battleground and potentially the area of war. We've also discovered in this crisis that uh, the European Union is now complementing NATO because in the times of the weaponization of everything, uh, it's no longer only military hardware, but you need to be able to deal with refugees, with energy, you need to give hope, and this is what the European Union can do. Uh, I think we've also agreed that we are moving after 30 years where just price did count to a, to a new world where security is absolutely uh, crucial and more important than just the lowest offer. And also that strategic sovereignty has become uh, absolutely crucial and critical for us. Of course, when a war is breaking out, it's all negative. 
so uh, we had a nice dinner yesterday evening <clears throat> and I would like to say maybe the outcome is also positive. Let's assume if the Ukraine is winning, which I think is now a real possibility, that Russian threat might be quite far away for a good time. Uh, by the way, we are also getting a European army and it's the Ukrainian army. Uh, which, are, which is defending our values uh, in the East against, uh, against Russia. So I think a lot of encouraging things are happening as well. For our own organization, I would just like to, to say two things. One, we've been discussing here that we need to move from ESPAS and uh, complement it by ISPAS. Uh, a view on the world which would just be European or just be transatlantic is not good enough anymore. So I think we all agree that in the round, in the run-up to the next uh, report, we will systematically take into account also views from Asia. What we traditionally think is the West is no longer just Europe and America. There are also Western values defended by Asian countries, and they should be part of this dialogue. Um, I've also suggested that maybe to steady a bit our content work, we could reflect of whether it would make sense to give us an additional kind of scientific board where we would bring in on a more steady basis scientific expertise mixed with, mixed with practitioners, but that's something to further reflect on. Thank you, James. Well, thank you very much, Klaus, for setting our, our discussions going. Go to next, Stephen. Over to you, please. Well, thank you. Thank you, James. Um, and. Um, Perhaps if I start, I think one of the things that I really got from, from the last two days is this, on the one hand, we have a sense that we, we remain very attached to our, our core values in the European Union, peace, prosperity, uh, solidarity, sustainability, but we're very challenged at the moment in how we achieve those goals because this, this wave of change coming at us uh, through crisis, uh, we hear this talk of permacrisis, the changing maps, um, uh, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of talk yesterday about uh, getting used to the idea of long-term instability and a changing world order. So we have coherent, strong values, but we're trying to do this in a world that is changing very fast. So how do we, how do we resolve that tension? I think a lot of the discussions over the last two days uh, have been helping us to see different avenues. I, I agree with you, Klaus, we have reason to be positive, but also quite a lot of uh, worries that we need to be thinking about. So how do we find those, uh, the balance and the way through those difficult waters? Uh, part of the answer, I think, is through foresight and through using our foresight tools to look ahead um, and to help navigate these waters, which in many ways for us are rather uncharted waters. Um, uh, there was a great phrase this morning, one of the sessions, one of the panelists said, we need to get away from the tyranny of today and be enable ourselves to think about tomorrow uh, in, a more, in a more alert way. And I think that our foresight practices can help us to do that. They can help inform the policy debate if we use them uh, in, the, in the right way. Um, uh, but uh, it was Anne Mettler who also said this morning, we, uh, and one of our predecessors as uh, a chair of ISPAS, um, we also need in the foresight world to be brutally honest uh, but, and, and I think this is, this is a very important message for us. Uh, we can't hide uh, some of these uncomfortable truths. I think foresight can really bring uh, this to the, to the fore. So I hope that we can continue to use the, um, uh, the community that we built here in ESPAS to inform the debate, to shape the debate, and hopefully to find pathways uh, through these very knotty, difficult, um, uh, uh, complex challenges that we're facing at the moment. Um, and I'm sure that, as, as Klaus says, uh, the, the process we're going through now to deepen uh, our international connectivity uh, is going to be an important contribution to that as we, as we go, through, go forward. Well, thank you very much indeed, Stephen. It's very nicely put, particularly this thing of living potentially in a permanent state of instability. And when we're looking ahead, I think that was a key takeaway. Didier, please. Well, the key event was obviously uh, the war. The consequences of the war will be the main priorities uh, seen, at least from the Council or European Council perspective. First of all, the economic impact, the energy impact, the food impact. What does it mean? And how can we 
maintain a balance between responding to real social needs urgently and nevertheless sustaining a long-term uh, sustainable agenda. What is the social impact? Because all the governance, uh, their budgets are basically being wrecked by uh, coping with the energy crisis, coping with inflation. Uh, what does it mean for our economic governance? And how will we manage public dissatisfaction? Uh, that's also one of the realities I think we will have to deal. Uh, the trade impact, um, we are using sanctions as a tool, as a trade tool, as a sanction tool. It leads to deglobalization. What is the impact of that? Uh, how will we manage uh, global trade in the longer term? But there is also an upside. The upside I see in the uh, energy climate axis, because real security of supply can only be achieved by decarbonization, by putting a lot of effort uh, on indigenous sources like renewables and so on. So there is also an upside uh, to what's going on uh, right now. Uh, so to me, it's not only the negative impact now, uh, where some governments are shifting to fossil fuels, but also the long-term uh, thinking. And I think also migration will be a thing at hand in the, in the coming months. Imagine that, for example, the Russians continue uh, with their bombardments each and every week on the infrastructure that is being repaired and rebombed again. What will it mean in terms of an exodus of the population in the winter. So I think this will be a real short-term priority with which we will have to deal. Well, thank you very much indeed for those thoughts. Um, I think that uh, we're waiting for Erwin. He'll be here in just a couple of moments. So before we open it out to questions, I have a question for each of you and then we can then develop our debate. Uh, Klaus, for you, uh, we have this uh, report now, this 2024 report. This is the first time I remember at the conclusion of an ESPAS conference, we actually have things to do which are very specific and which will fall into our next year's course, ESPAS conference too. So what for you are the key issues which that report should be addressing in, for the 2024 report? I mean, my, my thesis is that um, a period of 30 years, uh, which started in 1991 with the end of the Soviet Union, where we believed that system competition is over and we can now just do business and whatever the system doesn't matter, I believe that this period is over. And that comes with radical changes. We, we had a huge deflationary effect from the inclusion of China into the global economy. And we are now reflating uh, with all the social consequences that this has. And uh, it's nice to say security is now more important, but that basically means it's going to be more expensive. Uh, so that also means we are becoming poorer. And what does it mean for our political systems, uh, for the stability of our political systems, also for us in the European Union and in the member states? So I think what we have to spell out uh, besides um, issues in specific sectors, uh, is what is, this, what is this new world looking like uh, after the war in Ukraine? Uh, but also, and we cannot overlook this, uh, with the very fierce competition for number sta one status between the United States and China. Uh, we have seen, I think, two, three weeks ago that the United States have barred the delivery of the uh, highest technology uh, chips to China. They're even threatening American nationals who are still cooperating and working in this area to lose their citizenship. I just take this as an indication how serious that struggle is. Uh, if that were to, uh, let's say, um, explode, uh, the outcome would be much more severe than what we are currently seeing. So I think we have to prepare ourselves for a new world which is not following uh, according to the same rules than the ones we are accustomed to over the last 30 years. Thank you very much indeed for your comment there. Um, Stephen, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the ISPAS initiative because that's one which uh, you have been coordinating, if you like, the nine institutions of uh, ISPAS together and you were recently in Japan. So I thought uh, a word of that might be of interest to us all. Yes, of course. Um, so we've been working together uh, in the ISPAS process for the last 10 years and it's been gradually uh, expanding its its scope. It started off with just uh, four institutions and I think we now have 
nine nine different participants in the in the process. Uh, and so one of the discussions we were having uh, throughout this year was that we needed to perhaps bolster uh, our connectivity with international uh, partners. Of course, it's not that we haven't ever spoken to international partners over the last 10 years, but we haven't really had, uh, I would say, a structured process of, of engagement. Uh, so the thinking is to try to find a way of densifying that connectivity between the ISPAS partners and like-minded partners in, in other countries so that we can pick up different perspectives, a transatlantic perspective, uh, an Asian perspective, for example. Uh, and what we are thinking of doing is our main target at the moment is obviously to produce the next Global Trends Report, which will come out at the beginning of 2024 at the latest. Um, and that in the process of developing that report in the, uh, in the course of the next year, to try to design some uh, engagements with international partners on some of the topics and themes that we want to cover in the report so that we also take into account other perspectives to enrich uh, the thinking as we go along. And I think that uh, we'll try and do that in the course of next year. Hopefully when we're uh, back at the ISPAS conference in 2023, we'll be able to uh, benefit as well from some of the fruits of that, of that interaction and have a, have a very good and vibrant, um, not just European discussion, but also international discussion as we think about the, uh, the report at the beginning of 24. And finally, Didier, for you, um, this whole process of looking at strategic foresight and taking from what Stephen has said about someone who commented that we need to get out of the torments of today to be able to look, is this of real value for the council? Because are there other parts of the institutions where they're thinking longer term, where you can have this kind of co-institutional, inter-institutional approach, or is this the only one which exists within the EU institutions today? To me, ESPAS has a very big value because, first of all, it's inter-institutional nature. We don't have a bagage from our institutions, so it's not the classical institutional things where everybody is seeing it from its side of the corner of Schumann or, or Place Lux. So that has a huge advantage because you have a kind of collective uh, wisdom which is not determined by the traditional institutional rivalry, so I think that's very important. I think the international dimension that you mentioned is very important as well because uh, we need to be confronted with how others see the world as well and integrate it in our, uh, in our thinking. And finally, I think the most important thing is the European Council is more and more a crisis body, crisis management body, so we need to take them further mm. and basically connect uh, what is a short-term energy crisis and the long-term where we should go and not feel, uh, not lose the sight of that, so that we really can can guide them in these short-term decisions that they are not contradicting in the road ahead. And I think that's important that you have a bunch of people dealing with and innovating the real problems of the day on which they're focused, uh, but nevertheless uh, see it in a longer perspective. And that helps our planning. That helps also the solutions. Mm. Well, thank you for having put it so clearly in a nutshell, what holds us, I think, all together and the value of the SBAS network uh, as it's built for the last decade. So I think having had these statements from uh, the leaders of the SBAS community, I'd like to open the floor and pick up any questions that anyone would have at this stage. It's kind of what Americans call good for the whole. I mean, this is where at the end of the session, so we're all relaxed. We've done exactly what we planned to do. So people who have questions either online, of course, or from the floor here in the house, then please raise your hand and um, we can then have a few questions and have a discussion. And uh, that would be then very nice to be able to complete our conference. If there isn't, then we can always close the conference a little bit early, which would then be a dividend for all of us because we've been kind of busy today throughout the whole day. But I'm sure there must be somebody or a few people who would like to raise one or two issues. Uh, the floor is open. Well, this is very interesting, gentlemen. I think that uh, we have, I think, a situation, as far as I know, there's nobody online either who would like to pose a question. So um, I think maybe, uh, maybe last question is how, as we are coming out of a pandemic where 
We've had very little face-to-face -face thing within the network. It's been remarkable that we've held ourselves together online through Zoom and others. Uh, we have also had, of course, uh, the opening and the Russia invasion of Ukraine. These have changed huge things, which in many ways, these things were not predictable. I mean, these were really disruptive, so on. So uh, I think that from the point of view of uh, looking at the health, how do you see, we'd like to question this question very briefly, if you would, on the future of Europe, because this is part, we've taken about ESPAS, we've talked about the strategic foresight. Future of EU, is this something, Klaus, which uh, I know is you have a passion for, but you might be able to answer that, then I can take in Elve, and then we can, I think there's a couple of questions which I can pick up as well. Uh, please, Klaus. Yes, um, I think the starting point always has to be that we have exactly the same potential and nothing less than the United States of America. The only difference is political will. Do we want to go further? Don't we want to go further? But if you take the economics, if you take demography, we have the same potential. So the question is how much political will do we have and do we have a long-term vision? And there I think we are contributing here something very importantly. Because let's not forget where we are. We are one and a half years away, more or less, from the start of the European election campaign. And that means that all the institutions also have to clarify their mind, what do they want to achieve in the next five years? So the European Council will have a strategic debate with a paper that's coming out of it uh, before the summer break of 2024. Any commission president candidate will need to do the same. And in Parliament, of course, political groups, also European political parties, will need to come up with what is it that they will ask the Commission President candidate to put into practice over the next five years. So it's clear, and also through uh, the current experiences in Ukraine, that some bold moves are necessary. We can build on the current agenda, and that agenda remains valid, and had the advantage to be very clear uh, but uh, I think additional bold moves are necessary and uh, I think today has given us a lot of food for thought, uh, what could be added here also for those who have drafting jobs within the institutions. Food for thought is indeed a wonderful term. So may I just leave you both, uh, uh, Stephen, if I might, and Didier, and ask Elve to contribute because uh, very nice to see you, Elve. Thank you for uh, reaching us in time. So the floor is, you, if you have a microphone, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James, and apologies. Uh, geopolitics are, is back and uh, it's calling. So sorry for this. Um, maybe I'll just come back to the, the, the takeaways, and, uh, which highlight three roles of foresight and maybe three tasks for, for SPAS. I think what came out very clearly that uh, the need for the EU to adjust to reality of geopolitics, and as I think it was Stephen said, it, it, it needs brutal honesty as to the nature of the challenge. Um, and the, the clarity of our own core interest. We cannot fudge around that. One could say the others have pretty clear visions and clear interest of how they want to exert their statecraft. And therefore, for the EU, what has been, before, if I look back a, year, a few years ago, strategic autonomy was a kind of uh, sideline issue, was rather toxic. I think now it has become rather uh, center stage. The question is, what do we put under this? How we flesh it out? And I think this is really a, um, an, an agenda that the next uh, leadership should look into. So the foresight here has an alert function for the political establishment, and I think that is what on the challenges ahead. The second, and I heard it in a panel, is that it, can't, it cannot be left to technology alone. And again, it's that public policy making statecraft needs to be taken to another level in the face of the challenges we face and how we deal with the socio-economic dimensions of twin transition. It's not just about technology and getting it right on paper, but look at the, imp the, the impact internally and externally. Uh, it's also about how we address the rise of inequalities, poverty, and the erosion, erosion of democracy I had the, the honor of hosting an event this morning with the Nobel Peace Prize, Maria Ressa. And he said, the level of um, erosion is immense, but we are turning to one actor in the world, the EU. The third is, we can't do it alone. I think that was in our other panel. 
structural ch challenges and changes are so much that we need to build a common network, international network of sensors. So that's the point of ISPAS. So I think on these three levels, I think it gives a quite of a menu for, for, for the EU. But I think we should not be uh, downed by the magnitude of the gloom and doom, by the shock and awe of the challenges. As you said, um, Klaus, I think the EU commands a tremendous level of, of agency, a tremendous level of resources. And when you, maybe it's from the ES, coming from the ES, when you go around the world, even if there is uh, grievances towards the EU on many things, the grievances is a measure of the, actually the expectations that is, there is no expectation towards China, or maybe limited, of a different nature, towards the US, they have their own story, but they turn towards the EU. So I don't think we should be, you know, demean ourselves for all these challenges. I think we do have the capacity to act. It boils down to, indeed, political will, but I would add maybe statecraft, the way we do policies now is maybe a bit more complex, but the institutions working together can help in this respect. Thank you very much indeed, Herve. That uh, I think very nicely filled in what you probably didn't hear, but uh, I think from all of our points of view, it was... Uh, oh, I, I followed on the phone. Oh, <laughs> you're very astute then. We have, I think, one question over there, Dimitri, please. Thank you, uh, uh, James questions. and colleagues. I think an important takeaway from these two days of conference is that foresight is powerful. It's powerful for preparedness, but it's also powerful for raising inconvenient truths. Uh, putting the spotlight on some topics that sometimes are a bit overlooked. So a classic critique of foresight, however, at least of the foresight we do here, is that it's a little bit Eurocentric indeed. Even when we focus on the world, and actually it's good that I asked this question now that Hervé has arrived, uh, we bring our European foresight perspective. So it's actually quite important what you highlighted on the need to develop this international perspective on foresight, this ISPAS. So my question to the four of you actually is, what is the one thing that you believe we are now missing the most, that is the most urgent in order to build this international alliance, in order to create this ISPAS? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dimitri. I'd like to take all the questions together so that then we can be coherent. I have also a couple of questions. Oh, now I have even more questions. They're all coming thick and fast online, as of course it happens this way. Uh, is there anybody else from the floor who'd like to uh, speak at this stage? Otherwise, oh yes, yeah, sorry, okay, I'll put the microphone so you can hear me. Um, I think that um, what I'll do is that I'll um, be able to read out two or three of these questions. And then I'll ask each of the panelists to then pick them up and then hopefully we'll have got answers to them by the time that we've ended. Um, so here we go. Um, the, uh, where will be uh, the Transatlantic Alliance be in 2050? Uh, question to you, Klaus. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Would you still advocate for close cooperation with the US under a second Trump presidency? That's always hypothetical. Uh, what obstacles remain for further EU-NATO cooperation? And um, I think the last one um, is, um, I suppose, links to the question that you just said, Dimitri. Is the SPS website talks about the establishment of an ISPAS dialogue. How do panelists see the future of this international cooperation on foresight? So I think that probably gives you enough food for thought. Was I too quick? Were you able to note down, I think, the, some of the points which were raised? It's very nice to see that so many questions have come suddenly <laughs> online. When you're chairman, you see a blank screen, then you suddenly see 10 of them. You always wonder which one to choose. But I think that I've given you a flavor to be able to answer. So I think I'd like to go back uh, from the start, Eve, because you uh, came in um, kind of last. Now, having got this kind of flavor of the questions, would you like to give some concluding points? Because each of you have two, two three minutes each. Eve, over to you, please. I think there is one thing that maybe loops in the, the three questions. It has to do where are our partners, um, the US, uh, NATO, and we do have, I would say, like-minded partners. So I think at least to get uh, to be on a common page when it comes to, to foresight, I think is absolutely key to understand the different perspectives on the nature of the challenges. But you could consider that the, the EU and the US are pretty at a high watermark point in terms of the quality of the relations. So 
the negative view is that you, you can only go down from now. So the question is more how you lock it in so that it stays on the high level. I think that's the first point. With NATO and EU, you could say the same. And I think we are really at a high, at a high level. The division of labor, the complementarity, we have shown in the context of this uh, war of aggression against Ukraine how it plays out. And I think the EU has tremendous uh, contributions to make. And those who tend to pitch the NATO against the EU or the EU against the NATO, I think have been proven wrong. And I think we should continue to demonstrate that it is the case. And when it comes to his past, and maybe answering Dimitri's question, I think we need also probably to clarify dimensions of East Pass because there may be government to government East Pass network as much as there is a um, um, think tank and civil society to civil society think tank dimensions, which are not the same. So you can do what we call in the jargon of diplomacy, track one, government to war to govern, track two, which is uh, civil society to civil society, and track 1.5, which is the mix of the two to engage. And I think we should play across the board on the different dimensions. We should not limit ourselves to one or the other. I would just add one thing, is that we should be uh, careful of, uh, about the risk of group thinking. And I think engaging with the rest of the world, even with those who say things that we don't like to hear, I think we should not spare it. We are now in an outreach exercise with the so-called, I don't like the expression, the global south, which unfortunately has become viral, so I would use it for, for lack of better expression. We need to listen, we need to engage to other partners around the world. Maybe we drop the ball on that for too long, and I think they expect us, so we should really do double down. So I think I would not limit it to the like-minded, I think we need also to listen to others which are less like-minded but are critical partners too. I don't know how you did it, but that was another question which was just added to the system <laughs> so you were able to see my own instructions. Didier, please. That's foresight at work. That is enough. Um, <laughs> um, to pick the first one on the EU, NATO and the cooperation, as uh, Hervé said, but also Klaus initially, actually we have demonstrated how you can find the complementarité uh, in dealing with a multifaceted uh, crisis, military, humanitarian, macro-financial, and there was a clear natural division of labor that was developed in these months, so I'm not too worried uh, about that. On the transatlantic relations, well, where we will be in 2050, I don't know, but the reality is that there will be still lots of harmonious uh, points in our relationship, but there will be irritants as well. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is a clear one, and uh, it's probably their quest in their form of strategic autonomy, uh, to which our response should be also strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in selected areas, it doesn't mean that we have to, uh, to do it uh, all the way uh, on the ISPAS thing, there my point is, uh, is rather simple. It should uh, remain rather loose enough so that we still keep our autonomy in our reflection, in our thinking. Uh, it's perhaps a defensive point, but it's very good to have mirrors in the world and have a good exchange. We are not the, the only ones that see it from a Eurocentric perspective, but on the other hand, we need to keep our own capacity in our thinking. And that's to me an important point. Thank you very much indeed, Didier. Stephen, please. Thanks. I'm going to focus exclusively on the on the ISPAS um, question to avoid getting caught up in in, in transatlantic uh, discussions. Um, and I think there are, I mean, I'm not sure they're missing, but I think there are two things that are fundamental here to get right, uh, and it's time and it's trust. Okay, and time is is difficult because, and I think these apply, by the way, to foresight generally. You need time to do it. Um, but you also need time uh, in, the, in the audience that you're aiming to impact. So it's all very well doing great foresight, but if the politicians are so busy managing the latest crisis, they haven't got time to focus on the foresight, in a sense, you're whistling in the wind. So you need time to do good work and you need airtime to actually uh, uh, get, get a discussion going. And trust, it's exactly the same. You need trust to actually have the conversations you need to have but you also need trust to be heard, even if you're saying things that are maybe not so conventional, not so comfortable, uh, perhaps challenging uh, existing thinking. 
Um, so that would be my wish that I think Isbas uh, is a place where we try to carve out time and where we try to build trust and that we can perhaps use that platform uh, to develop uh, internationally. But I take Hervé's point as well. We need to be talking to people not just with like-minded uh, partners but also with partners with different perspectives because that's how we, how we enrich the dialogue. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. Klaus, please. Okay, on the first question on uh, is bus, I would like to use a Silicon Valley slogan, which is, uh, done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be my recommendation here. Uh, why don't we just do a small conference? It could also be digitally. We bring some people together without obligation, but we just start to listen. I mean, to not regularly listen, for example, to India, which is a huge country, and surely with problems, but a democracy continental of continental size, I think is a mistake. Uh, to not systematically listen to Brazil, I think is a mistake. To not have a close cooperation with Japan as well. So I would say there are surely difficulties in this process, but I would just start. I would start without formalization and uh, uh, I think that's what we should do and that's what we need to do in order to have a good product for 2024. Uh, how is the alliance going to look like in 2050? I don't know, but I do know that it will remain absolutely necessary. If that alliance wouldn't be there anymore, we would live in a world that definitely would not be better, but a much more dangerous place. Um, and concerning EU and NATO, I think we agree here that the European Union is starting to to take its place as a complementary element in the security and defense architecture. And I think that can only develop further because the United States will have to concentrate much more on Asia. And the request will simply be there, including also by the Americans, that Europeans do more for their own defense. And we then have an interest that this is happening in an organized fashion and where the European Union as an institution is also playing um, its own role. Yeah, well, listen, um, I think that um, I'll just conclude our session and uh, thanking our speaker, but I'd like to make three comments out of a whole kind of debate. Uh, firstly, probably it wasn't surprised many to know my interest in transatlantic stuff, which has gone back more than 30 years. But I think that the point which is really critical is that over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen the issues which the transatlantic relationship, particularly the EU-US relationship, has covered, have accelerated, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine has done even more to make that agenda more and more crowded with the energy or food or other things, which wasn't a typical staple of EU-US relationships. And so the fact that uh, this, this framework which it contains is a new transatlantic agenda probably isn't sufficiently strong to be robust enough when you get big issues like the Inflation Reduction Act and others. So we need to think probably in the short term how we can do that under, after all, a presidency of the United States was probably the most European in history, certainly most European since Eisenhower. Secondly, I think that what we ought also to take out of our debates and out of the comments that you have all made is this process which we have now of being able to focus on strategic issues out with the normal hullabaloo of daily life, which is the 2024 report process. And we have, I think, uh, ambitions to be able to tackle a whole range of different issues to prioritize this. We'd welcome report comments from people who are listening to us today to be involved in this. This isn't a closed process. This is an open process, why we're talking about it today, and I'm typically, therefore, not going to be revealing the report when it comes out. It's the process, I think, of the report, which is going to be as important as the results which we come out with, of seeing, of involving people as much as possible to see what the balances should be. And that's why our conversations in the last two days have been so valuable, that we've had lots of different types of views 
views expressed, and it uh, is never going to be a harmonious result. But in the end, I think that what we can do is mobilize and focus people's decision-making in the policy-making process by contributing ideas which can then help the next five years after 2024. So I think the exercise is very well timed, and what you've all said I think is very positive to have this going at this particular juncture. And lastly, I think that this issue of the ISPAS process is a fascinating one because, you know, before the pandemic, you might have said, well, how are we going to network everybody together? How are you going to get people to travel? How are you going to be able to do this kind of stuff? But guess what? We're online. We've been online for two years. And so we have, oddly enough, a significant gain for our operations in ISPAS and in future on ISPAS to be able to connect with a whole range of people who we wouldn't have been able to do that before. So an idea we have, I think, Klaus, you picked it up, is that before our next conference, we'll have a Zoom link or WebEx or whatever it is with international partners, which won't be exclusive to be able to those who would be willing to engage in us. Because I think it was one of the sessions, it was a Singapore representative saying how valuable it would be to have an international network where we could informally discuss issues, key issues together. So I think we're in the position to be able to contribute to that process. So uh, as we are now uh, one minute away, all I can do now is to thank our panel very much indeed for the incisive comments that they made, really interesting to be given a sense of momentum out of this conference. That we're not uh, turning around saying, gosh, we now have to start working on the next conference. That is a platform on its way to a much more focused objective of the report of the ISPAS dimension and collectively to make a stronger European Union in the future. So thank you all very much indeed. And I know I have to now hand it over to you to make uh, a few closing remarks, I think, Stephen. This is afterwards, so the session is now ended. It's end of time. Thank you very much indeed. The world is constantly moving. Every day we face new challenges that have an impact on the paths we take for the future. War has come to you. Democracy is being tested. Climate change is an existential threat to our planet. Energy security and food supplies are being seriously disrupted. The future seems more and more uncertain. We need to prepare better for the long term and be ready to deal with the new global shifts and shocks. The future is in our hands. Charting a course for Europe's future by making the right choices. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of the ISPAS uh, conference for 2022. I'd like to thank you all for being with us uh, both in this room for the last two days and for joining us online. We've had 14 panels, over 50 speakers, a great deal of interactivity, and I think you'll all agree that we've had really a great spread of, of discussion, and I couldn't possibly uh, summarize it all uh, in, the next, in the next five minutes, but I do just want to try to pull a couple of threads together before we run away on a, on a Friday evening and, uh, and try to get some relaxation. I'll try and do it in, in just in three quick blocks. I think um, the first bundle of threads that we heard in, um, in the different sessions over the last couple of days was that we are really in a, in a moment of change. Um, we've got this very new, unstable global order. We've got tectonic shifts happening. Things aren't going to go back to normal. So we have to prepare ourselves for this period of long-term instability and we need to find a new place in this rather uh, in unstable world. And that that comes on top of a lot of challenges that we were already facing, uh, climate change, uh, technological disruption, demographic, democratic uh, challenges, as well as demographic challenges and inequalities. So there's a lot that we have to get our heads around at the same time, and that the ripples of this are really being felt everywhere. We heard some, some strap lines, weaponization of everything. We heard about um, dependencies, 
uh, and we heard about challenges to existing models. And one phrase that I really got from, from yesterday is that uh, we face um, a, a situation in which we're all going to be poorer, um, uh, we're all going to be potentially less democratic, less sustainable. These are quite worrying things to be hearing. So the challenges are quite big. So the diagnosis is, in a sense, a little bit gloomy. But then we also had a lot of input on the, on the solution side, on the remedy side. Um, and on the one hand, we heard uh, quite a lot of input about things that we can do better and things that we can do differently. Uh, perhaps that we need to do faster. And I think the different sessions we had gave us different lenses about how we might do that, whether it's looking at health, whether it's looking at food, looking at energy, looking at technology, looking at the future of capitalism or the future of markets, depending on your, on your preferred um, definition, that there are ways in which we need to adapt and adjust to this new reality. And I think we got a lot of good pointers over the last two days about how we might do that. But the other thing I heard is that we perhaps also need to think about doing different things. So not just doing things differently, but doing different things. And this is, I think, a bit more challenging because this takes us into the challenges of the international order uh, or perhaps bringing in new and different ways um, of acting. So the question I think that we will be working on the foresight community is how to draw those threads together. Somebody this morning was talking about Lincoln's uh, quote, we need to uh, think anew and act anew. So how do we take account of all of this and how do we find these, these new balances? Um, and then Janusz Potocznik this afternoon said, you can't fix the wrong system by making it more efficient. Huh? So we need to be making sure that we're trying to fix the right things, not doing more of the wrong things. Now I think foresight can help us to navigate these quite difficult waters uh, to map both what we know and also to help us to understand uh, better our present so that we can anticipate better our future as well. So we have some tools that will help us to be better prepared, that will help us to be um, better able to respond, and perhaps also to have some quite honest dialogues with policymakers and politicians about what needs to come next. We've heard in the last panel how ESPAS provides us uh, a, a way of doing that, both at EU level and international level, and we certainly will continue to do that over the next year. Uh, by this time next year, when we convene for the 2023 ESPAS conference, we'll have made good progress, I hope, on our, on our, um, uh, on our next report, and we'll have some good material to discuss. Um, to conclude, I would like to, uh, if you allow me, just say some words of thanks, uh, because behind this conference is a fantastic organizing team. On the Parliament side, um, uh, we have the team of Graham Carter, and I want to name these people because they've done some amazing work, and you haven't necessarily seen them here, but they've been working extremely hard. We've got Aurore and Albert, uh, we've got Momo and Karin and Milana, and we've got the team that produced the video that we've been enjoying, and, and all the trainees that work with Graham. And on the Commission side, uh, my colleagues Valerie, Maurizio, Laurent, and Gianmarco, who've also been helping with the, with the whole conference. So I'd just like to ask you to give these colleagues a round of applause for the fantastic work that they've done. And thanks, thanks, of course, to all of our speakers, our panelists, uh, to you, the audience. Um, the recordings of everything that we've, that we've um, experienced will go online at the beginning of next week, so you can catch up, and please do share it, because I think there's a great investment that's been made. Let's share it, let's make the most of it, um, and let's look forward already to seeing you all here next year. Thank you all very much, and have a great evening.